of the athletes. Well, a statement did come out mid-morning from the British Olympic Association, which said all Team GB athletes will wear the Union Jack as normal in Paris. However, Team GB kit itself is expected to include different shades of blue or red as in previous years. Well, I'm sorry, I don't really buy that. Now, we sent Adam Cherry out to Wembley today to ask some members of the public how they felt about this. This episode of companies fixing things that weren't broken. We're going to be asking the people of London what they think of the changing colours of the Team GB Olympic logo. Take a look at this. The blue, the red and the, the white, it's perfect. I feel like, you know, it shouldn't be that controversial, controversial but, you know, it's iconic. I feel like the, yeah. the, the colours are iconic. Everyone's known London for being, you know, red, white and blue. I feel like it doesn't really represent England like that. Yeah, the, yeah. the colours of the... Like the colours are kind of random. I, I think it's very colourful. Mm. It's very uh, pinkish and uh, quite unicornish kind of thing, yeah. A bit too unicornish for Team GB. A little bit. Disgusting. Well, we're British. And our colours are not pink and what purple and... So, like, you know, some patterns on there. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. going crazy. That's not our flag. Yeah. That don't represent me. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Good evening, the top stories this hour. Angela Rayner says she'll step down if it's determined that she committed a criminal offence over her tax affairs. It's over the sale of her council house in Stockport a decade ago. Questions have been asked about whether she paid the right amount of tax and if it was her main home. In a statement, she said the questions raised relate to a time before she was an MP and that she's taken expert tax and legal advice. Sir Keir Starmer says the investigation will reveal the facts. We welcome this investigation because it will allow a line to be drawn in relation to this matter. Um, I am fully confident that Angela Rayner has not broken the rules. She will cooperate with the investigation as you would expect uh, and it's really a matter for the police. Energy Minister Graeme Stewart has announced he's standing down from his cabinet role to focus on local issues. The Beverley and Holden SNP said he plans to focus on issues such as making roads safer, broadband delivery and increasing the number of defibrillators in his constituency. He said he's proud to have served in government over the past eight years and he'll fully support the Prime Minister from the backbenches. Sir Keir Starmer says he's committed to boosting the UK's defence budget to... 2.5% if he becomes Prime Minister, matching the current government's target. The Labour leader visited a shipyard in barrow in Furness where nuclear submarines are being built. He says Britain's nuclear deterrent is the bedrock of Labour's plan to keep the country safe and said his party was making what he called a generational commitment to defence. The government described the plan as a distraction. Researchers have discovered the cause of the brightest burst of light ever recorded. The luminous burst of light, which occurred more than 2 billion light years from Earth and lasted just mere seconds, was so bright it was said to have blinded space instruments. The findings published in the journal Nature Astronomy suggest boats brightest of all time's likely origin is an explosion or supernova that came after the collapse of a massive star. And Giorgio Armani has paid tribute to fellow Italian fashion designer and true artist Roberto Cavalli, who's died at the age of 83. Cavalli reportedly died at home in Florence after a long illness. The fashion guru founded the company in 1975, quickly becoming known for its animal print designs. For the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's time for headliners.
Thank you, Tatiana. Hello and welcome to Headliners, your run through the next day's newspapers with three comedians. I'm Leo Kurth and tonight I'm joined by the people's gammon, Paul Cox, and a man who can't have gammon for religious reasons, it's Josh Howie. How are you both doing? Lovely. It's good. Cool. Well, actually, no, speaking of that, my wife, before it was Friday night pizza night, and before I came here, my wife, we, the treat that we get for family is ordering Domino pizza. Yeah. And she got ham by mistake on the pizza. Really? Oh my God. And I ate into it and I was like. <laughs> so we, pineapple wasn't even the worst thing on that pizza I for love, you? I love pineapple. There was pineapple there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I was uh, very upset. What happens now, Josh? Is that the end of. Uh, <laughs> it could you, be a filing, filing for divorce. She accidentally, she's like, oh, Zero, who's our youngest. Oh, he accidentally clicked on the. He was helping me. And right. he, yeah, yeah, sure. She wanted ham on that pizza. <laughs> and I'm not going to let her get away with it. All right, well, that's the chit chat out of the way. Let's have a More! Look. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a quick look at Friday's front pages. The Daily Mail leads with, I'll quit. Rainer, I'll quit if I'm found guilty. The I Weekend has UK intelligence officials targeted in honey trap sex plots by Chinese spies. The Guardian leads with, end cruel prosecution of carers, Sunak urged. The Sun has, nightmare. That's about Gordon Ramsay's uh, pub being squatted, I believe. The Telegraph has, Rainer, I will quit if guilty over house row. And the Times has pressure on Starmer as police look into deputy. And those were your front pages. And let's have a closer look at those front pages, starting with the Daily Mail, which leads with the, the story about Rayner, who says, I'll quit. I'll quit if I'm, if I'm guilty. I mean, surely she knows, Josh. <laughs> well, that's it. But if she's found guilty... Right. She, <laughs> so if, I, if I get if away get, with if it... I, if I get away with it, then everything's, uh, everything's cool. So Everything's kosher, apart from my pizza. So, <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is the story. It's sort of obviously blowing up ever more. I think they was hoping it would go away a few mm. weeks ago, and now it's come back. Um, uh, at least she's not, she doesn't really have a choice here, but she's not being like too much of a hypocrite in terms of, you know, she's called for, for uh, the investigations into Tories, including Johnson. So she can't really go, but oh, leave me alone. So she had yeah. to go, yeah, okay, fine, I'll, I'll go along with it. She seems obviously pretty confident. Uh, the issue seems to be about whether she provided false info for the electoral register in yeah. around 2010. The tricky thing is that actually, on the register, it's not about like where your main residence is. It's actually about where your permanent address is. So there's a technicality there that means that she might. So she could get be off okay. on, on that technicality. Well, you know, yes. Not that, not that I'm saying you know she. Not that I'm implying she she is in, in any way uh, <laughs> committed. <laughs> some massively but there is there is that sort of uh, that differing uh, difference in uh, yeah, yeah, definitions. Referred. But that's why it's a stupid thing to say. Because the technicality doesn't exonerate you in the public uh, court. Yeah. So what happens is you end up getting away with something. And by the way, I mean, the only reason this is a big story is because she spent a lot of her career pointing a finger. If she hadn't done that, I don't think it would have been such a big story. I don't think it actually is that big a story. Yeah. I just think, given it's an election year, given how outspoken she is, Given the things that she said and done, she's put herself in hot water. It's politics. It's why she said this. But if, unless she gets 100% cleared, yeah. then it's always going to hang over and it's going to cost the Labour Party a little bit. Well, they might only have a majority of 97. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, my, my gut reaction, when I first heard about this, I was like, oh, this is just a nonsense over nothing. I mean, you know, she's a champagne socialist with, uh, with multiple houses. You know, what Labour politician isn't? <laughs> and, uh, you know, fair enough, she's made an error filling in forms or she's tried to, you know... Uh, Whatever, it's not much of a big deal. But then, yeah, I remembered she was pointing the finger at Boris for for having a slice of cake or being yeah. ambushed with with a cake. And uh, yeah, it does like like you say, Josh, it does seem to be uh, hypocrisy. Well, look, yeah, there is hypocrisy, and as we know, everybody, including myself and including people watching this, can be guilty of hypocrisy. Yeah, like you say, Paul, she went out there, pointed that finger. Uh, I think they would make it into a big story because I think I think the Conservative press are desperate to find any yeah. means to attack Labour. Yeah. They can't really land a, a punch on um, on Keir Starmer, so they're going after her. I don't know if Keir Starmer's that bothered about it, to be honest. I mean, obviously, it being election year, but they aren't, like, yeah, super buddies. She, I mean, she's a rival of Keir Starmer. She's she's obviously yeah. got her eyes on the top job, so maybe Keir's like, oh, I can I can get rid of her. Yeah, but the problem is that the, 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 the deputy is voted for by the members. Yeah, right. Um, 
Uh, and I think they've come to some well, sort democracy, of... Democracy, that seems like a agreement. terrible system. I know, certainly in Labour. Yeah. They <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's backfired for them in the past. <laughs> uh, moving on, next up is the I Weekend poll. What have they got? Yes, uh, more of this honey trap type stuff. UK intelligence officials targeting honey trap sex plots by Chinese spies. So British intelligence officials, Leo, have been reportedly targeted in honey trap plots, um, which, uh, according to the source, uh, has included things like um, being approached uh, by a woman uh, who was described as young and attractive. Uh, and usually, usually helps if you've got yeah. a honey trap. I mean, to be fair, it's not going to be Sophie um, Hagen. I would be. I would be. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't understand. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'd be very suspicious if uh, a woman attracted me, whether she was young and attractive or not. <laughs> I, I think I'd put, it'd put a doubt straight into my mind, and I thought, <laughs> you know, I'm being attacked, particularly if she was Chinese. I think, hang on a minute, here, you mm. blooming spy. But, but, but would you be tempted to see how far? You could go. Oh, I would complete the sexual act <laughs> and then uh, just you know, tell them what they wanted to know. Yeah. And then spring out of bed and yeah. say, You're not getting any secrets. Well, yeah. this is it, but this is, that's what's so funny in this article. And by the way, this isn't a story at all. This is like it's happened two times over the last <laughs> yeah, 10 years, but it just happens to tie into recent stories about the Tories uh, being, or, or the, actually not Tories, but everybody being um, spear trapped or whatever it is. Yeah. But uh, what's funny is in <laughs> France, it just didn't work. They tried all this and it right. didn't work, and they were like, then they were like, we're going to blackmail you and tell their wives, uh, tell your wives, and they're like, yeah, my wife knows I'm having an affair. <laughs> <laughs> they were just totally fine yeah, about it, it. It doesn't work in Britain either because we're too awkward to actually uh, no engage in a conversation with a woman. Well, that's, that's the thing. So, as Paul was saying, yeah, you've got to be suspicious. But this is really a good time to join the intelligence services and hopefully then you're going to get lucky. Well, yeah, Paul, I mean, do you think this is going to help the intelligence services in the UK recruit? Yeah. Mm. Young and attractive women. It's... Uh, uh, to. Obviously, but it's going to attract. Of course, it's going to attract men. If this is what, if this is what this, they do to get, tell me some this, secrets, right? This is like real life James Bond. Brilliant. Tell me as many secrets as you like. Put me in a bar with lots of attractive <laughs> women. Let's see what happens. And if I fail, ah, well, you never know. Do you think a lot of men will be changing? Do you think a lot of men will be changing their Tinder profiles to say, "I work for MI5"? Yeah. <laughs> This is, new, this is new thing. But it does say, like, oh, we've been trained to deal with this or to expect this, but the problem is that there are business leaders mm. who might need some training. If there are any business leaders watching this show, I would just like to say this is my two-second lesson how to do it. If you're fat and bald and a fit young woman comes up to you and wants to have sex with you for no reason, yeah, do it. she might be a spy. That's just all, that's all I'm saying. Just that, but yeah. still do it. Yeah. Be suspicious. Yeah, be suspicious. Get worse in the mouth, Josh. <laughs> uh, what are The Guardian leading with, Josh? Uh, they're going with end cruel prosecution of carers, Sunak urged. This is, this is a disturbing story because... Mm. Um, the carers have sort of been, a, uh, some of them even convicted, but have been hounded for a few thousand pounds for literally going over a couple of pounds a week. Mm. Um, and this is the carer's allowance. Or... For the carer's allowance, yeah. And it's ridiculous in that, as, as it's pointed out here, carers, un uh, unpaid carers save the economy £160 billion wow. pounds a year. Well, they... that's, that's assuming we'd pay them. Well, th well I mean... no, I mean, what, yeah, so... The, it, it's not like these people are living it up. Yeah. You yeah. know, they have very str stressful, very, very tough lives. And some of the amounts are as low as... Apparently, one man was convicted for 30 pence a week. Yeah. So, which is just, you know... Whereas, whereas of course, billions uh, are going... Uh, are being lost in the... Trying to re-get our taxes by the richer companies or by, com uh, by companies, by rich individuals. So the idea of just going after these easy targets, I don't know if it, why they would do so. I mean, it's just yeah. this kind of... Whether it's the inhumanity of just people filling in forms well, or whether it's it, a boost their numbers. I think it's a, it's a process, and when they see that there's a discrepancy in the amount, then it automatically triggers the process. But it does seem that, you know, this process could be applied a bit more judiciously, Paul. Of course it could, and it's, you know, it's, it's, what, it's what big government's all about, isn't it? Not understanding what's happening at the sharp end of things. Yeah. And we should be measured as a nation by the way we treat our most vulnerable and most misfortunate in our society. And time and time again, particularly with carers, they are... They're undermined, undervalued, vilified in some cases. Yeah. And, of course, you know, you could be on one side of the argument which says, well, you know, there are rules to them, there are policies and we should have certain things in place and, and they're stealing money. And then there's the right side of the argument, which is, look, these guys are looking after people for no money whatsoever. Well, a little bit of money. 30p a week. I mean, that's what I get. Well, that, what... that was the discrepancy. But, the, yeah, there is a, a care, carer's allowance. Mm.
Yeah, no, not, them, not, them not, them cover. not them bitter as a taxpayer. No, of course, but I always think that something like, you know, I'd, I could turn a blind eye to someone like this quite happily. Yeah, yeah. If I was in charge of a department like this, I'd be like, how much is that? Oh, they, we've overpaid them by five grand. Yeah. Don't worry about it. If you were a jury, you wouldn't be like, yeah, send this man. Send this man. There Clap will, of jeans. course, be some bad eggs within the mix who have taken advantage of the you system. You sound like a post office boss. Um, yeah, and, uh, the, you know, I think they're still all guilty, to be honest. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's uh, just quickly squeeze in this one, uh, Paul. It's the, the sun. Nightmare. Gordon's... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's the only word that was in the headline. <laughs> Gordon's posh eatery invaded by squatters. He's, hey, posh eatery, this is a pub that he owns that's worth £13 million. And the author of this story, the journalist, has written it in a way that makes me think he thinks... I should care. Right. I, I, I don't care whether he's got squatters in his £13 million <laughs> pub. Why would I care? I mean, of course, it's a bit well, of a pain if it was my £13 million pub. But this is a man who's well, made his if, you're, if, if you're having a paint in there... You'd, yeah, yeah, exactly. But they're people, patrons. Squat they're people who go in and stay all day and drink beer. These are actual squatters. I mean, if you make your living out of knock, knocking up a bit of grub and swearing at people, yeah. I don't care if you've got a little bit of a problem with your life. OK, well, that's it for the front pages. But coming up, Iran gears up for war, sexual harassment in the NHS and sexual entrapment and the intelligence services, which we just just covered, <laughs> we won't have it in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Britain's newsroom, weekday mornings from nine thirty. It's a remarkable story, isn't it? Amazing, extraordinary, and also she was unflappable. Apparently, yeah. the Princess Royal She's just brilliant. refused to get out of the car and said, I'm not going anywhere. Extraordinary. Well, Jim Beaton was awarded the George Cross for protecting the Princess and delighted to say, joins us now, along with the former head of Royal Royalty Protection, Di Davis. Jim, you won't remember, but I met you some time ago at the Imperial War Museum when Princess Anne was opening an exhibition to do with the George Cross and you were there reunited with her. Um, and you told me then what great admiration you had for the Princess cool under fire, but you didn't do so badly yourself. It was probably my job. And also, um, I had a wee bit of police training, not very much, but a little bit, uh, whereas uh, Princess Anne had nothing. And yet, the way she displayed it, you would have thought she'd been uh, highly trained to um, deal with any type of that situation. Even though you'd had some training, you took three bullets for the princess. You effectively stood between her and a deranged gunman. Well, I was supposed to be a protection officer, really, so um, I just tried to fuddle about. You must remember that back in 1974, there was no communication, and we were extremely lucky that Michael Hills who was outside Clarence House and nearby, had got one of the fast police radios, um, or radios on his shoulder, so he was able to send a message out. Otherwise, we would have just been relying on the good old public to phone in and say there was something happening. Yeah, so means... times have changed drastically. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Issues about it. <laughs> Welcome back to Headliners. I'm Leo Curse. I'm still here with Josh Howie and Paul Cox. The Guardian now with the latest on the post office scandal. A post office boss is in trouble for his comments. Although maybe something was lost in the delivery, Josh. Very nice. Thank Ex post you. office nice. boss. Yeah. Uh, he wrote of subbies with hand in the till inquiry. Here's this is a 2009 uh, email. This is Alan Cook. 
And, uh, yes, and he says that it's, he's incredibly ashamed and it'll haunt him forever, of course, not as much as the people whose families have been absolutely destroyed. Um, this continues, uh, this, the inquiry, uh, and it's... the que I think they're looking for this kind of smoking gun and the one person who is the evil villain behind it all. And I think you've just got a lot of little villains making these assumptions, whether this was the beginning of the rot and him yeah. just kind of going, oh, yeah, it's probably just a bunch of people stealing it, and then people taking that lead and pushing... But, but, it, but I mean, that's some pretty sort of wild speculation. I mean, from his, his point of view, it seems to be that there was... Uh, th this was a test... There was a test case that was... That, from his point of view, proved that the IT system uh, wasn't at fault. So he was under the belief mm. that, you know, this IT system was robust. Yeah. And, uh, and also, I mean, one of the individuals pleaded guilty. So this is who, who he's talking about. And it's like, why would you plead guilty to something you haven't done? I mean, I'm, I'm not a legal expert, but that seems like a bad idea. For attention because their parents didn't like them, Leah. Well, the, the, uh, she, she was convinced, obviously, by lawyers... That, that oh, sorry, that's probably yeah, right, yeah. yeah. I'd never trust a lawyer. Oh, yeah, well... No, uh, given all we know, this is quite unfortunate, though, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I always have a slight issue uh, with going back and uh, this kind of retrograde approach where we go, look at his email from 2009. I would hate my emails from 2009 to be exposed. <laughs> I have no idea what I said. We just say whatever it took to make sure I got paid at the end of the yeah. month. And it is human nature, let's not forget, for us to su be suspicious of other humans, yeah. particularly given when there's money involved. So whilst there is a very sort of caring narrative to this, which we all agree with, that, yeah. that people were extremely badly treated and it ruined lives and some people weren't exonerated before they died. There is also a human nature to this and a flip side to this where there were people that, you know, there were information given from Fujitsu that gave the impression Would that you? their system... Fujitsu! Uh, that gave the impression that, um, you know, the system probably wasn't at fault and because they were saving their own bacon. Human nature again, and it's at yeah. play. And we seem to, in this world of social media where you just got to keep everything to 140 characters unless you pay for a premium and get a blue <laughs> tick, then you... It's very easy to point the finger and just be too concise about things. Yeah, I mean, do you think this, this guy's been made into a bit of a scapegoat, which is a goat that the Romans used to all escape on? Uh, yeah, I... <laughs> I think, uh, no, like I said, I think that he's one of, not a scapegoat at all, I think he is part of the problem. And right. I think it's, there is obviously a wider problem as well, which is this faith in technology, the infallibility of it, mm -hmm. and it, and this kind of also a uh, disdain for his workers. He's sort of saying that he's unaware that any of these prosecutions are going ahead. Right. He's the boss. Yeah. Like, to sort yeah. of turn around and go, oh, I didn't know any of this was happening. Yeah, I don't believe that Come for a on. moment. No, no, that's why you're getting <laughs> millions of pounds. Yeah, yeah. Well, moving on, we've got The Guardian now with good news for the left-wing progressives who read The Guardian. Iran might wipe out Israel and install an Islamic theocracy, Paul. They're going to love that. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Uh, US warns threat of significant Iranian attack on Israel remains viable. So two US officials also reportedly say a missile and drone attack could be launched as early as Friday evening, which is now as we speak. Mm. And uh, that's a worry, irrespective of the propaganda war, um, and there is a huge propaganda war, as, as uh, Josh will attest to. Don't know what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> with regards to with regards to Israel and Palestine, this is the escalation I think we all fear. Yeah. Because if it kicks off in the Middle East, and Iran are the perpetrators. Israel are isolated. No matter what you've been told about Israel, they are, will be isolated in the Middle East, which means that we in the West, as Israel supporters, are duty bound to support Israel, and that means attacking Iran. And the West attacking Iran is a huge escalation. Yeah. Uh, we haven't got there yet. Israel um, have attacked people... That, now, this is, all, this is all tit for tat, let's not forget this. This is a result of, of other things, and I'm sure Josh will, will get to this in a minute. Um, but any escalation, any attack of Israel, particularly from Iran, is yeah. a big step forward into the unknown, I think, Josh. Well, yeah, I mean, it, Iran has already admitted to, uh, to sort of basically funding Hamas. Yeah, their letter came out today showing that they paid uh, 200 million towards the funding of mm. the attack, um, and they provided logistical help and training. So, yeah, Israel then um, uh, basically blew up the couple of their generals yeah. uh, who in, were... In, in Syria? In Syria, yeah. yeah. So this is going to be the retaliation for that. So, as you say, but... but um, I'm... I don't know if it's going to... America's basically said, 
we're going to step in if anything kicks off. Right. So it's whether Tehran really wants a war with America as well as this, Israel. This is like a dad watching two kids fight. I mean, it's like, if it gets too rough, I'm going to step in. Yeah. Well, also, like, they've got missiles and they've got technology. What they don't have is a particularly great army. The IDF right. is arguably the best regional army. Yeah. Uh, also, in terms of isolation, the Iran is... You know, is against Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And so, actually, there's a sort of tacit yeah. kind of agreement. And a, and a lot of the countries in the Middle East that, you know, maybe 40 years ago would have been uh, wanting to join the fight against Israel are actually now uh, economically, uh, or, or just for, for reasons of diplomacy, um, you know, not wanting to get involved and, and really wanting this to simmer down. But it is, it is scary, and I think it's most scary, of course, for the people living in Israel, because people forget that it's a, it's a tiny, tiny sliver yeah. of land. The size of kind of whales. Yeah. Uh, and so, it, the, it, and they are very close to each other It's in, in that way. Yeah. Um, so any missiles can slip through. Israel is being bombarded still from Gaza. It's, it's got Hezbollah up in the north sending missiles over. There are people I know who are just um, living their lives under this kind of constant running to bomb shelters and stuff. That never gets reported in the yeah, press. Yeah. Um, and I think, obviously, people are going to be very scared this evening. Yeah, well, let's hope it all calms down. We've got The Independent now with a story about sexual harassment in the NHS. It really is bad. I saw a documentary about it called Carry On Nursing, Josh. Yeah, I was thinking they, maybe they should do, like, a woke version of Carry On Nursing. <laughs> <laughs> Carry On Nursing. Yeah, it's called 24 Hours in A&E. Is that what it is? OK, do they, do they just, <laughs> does anyone get their boobs up? Uh, occasionally, but I mean, I mean, it's, it's, usually, it's usually for an official medical treatment. Like I a, will give it a... Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll check it out. Uh, <laughs> so NHS bosses, yeah, boss calls for sexual harassment to be stamped out as Ed, uh, health service faces Me Too movement. So this is very 2012. I thought that we'd sort of done the Me Too movement. I thought that we'd all kind of come together as a society and go, you know what, sexual assault uh, against women is, is, uh, is bad. Nobody found out in the public sector. I, I guess not. Uh, when you're reading the article, a lot of it is unclear as to where this is coming from. Uh, is this the public or is this from sort of fellow NHS workers? It yeah, seems like it's majority from the public. When they talk about um, it seems like there's one in 26 uh, reporting se sexual harassment from a work colleague, but it's one in eight uh, from general public, so there's an issue there. One in eight from workers. One in eight workers. 58,000 reported experiencing for... unwanted sexual behaviour last year. Yeah, yeah, but, but but it's one in 26 reporting it coming from other workers. Oh, say... so it's coming from member, members yes. of the public and that, are going and into that's hospital? What's not, what's, that's not really... Fo right. So there's a few examples here that are very disturbing uh, uh, and are involving co-workers, but it right. does seem like the majority of the stuff actually is coming from the general public, and I don't know how you deal with that. So, Paul, we've just got a degenerate British public. Which we knew anyway. <laughs> I mean, that's... We, that's, we top the league table on that sort of stuff. Uh, so... We're number is, one. Putting aside the disturbing statistic, whether it's one in eight, which is 12.5%, by the way, yeah. of all of their workforce, Great or, or one in 26, yeah, I'm, I'm not bad at maths, actually. Okay, Stephen Allen, calm down. <laughs> on those two, <laughs> that's, that's it, that's the... I actually use a calculator. But... And I hate to do this, I hate to be that guy, Leo, but it's not defined in here what sexual harassment is, and that's what makes it a statistic like this. Well, you know uh, when you massaged me earlier? Yeah, that was. And it was so, a little bit weird. You did ask. <laughs> I mean, you didn't ask me to be naked, but I just assumed. <laughs> Look, yeah. I, I, I'm not taking anything away from this, and that's what I'm saying, it's a disturbing statistic. But we have to understand what the definition, definition is. Yeah. Because it's then you can really see the true extent. And right. the trouble with saying everything is sexual harassment is the actual sexual harassment can often get mixed. Missed, not mixed, right. gets mixed in. But um, it's very disturbing, especially what Josh is saying, that there are a member of the public going in, probably into places like A&E yeah. and being... Extremely inappropriate. Yeah. And, uh, well, is, it, is it the fault of the gowns that they wear? Because you know your bum yes, sticks out the back. They shouldn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah you should. You know, I mean, you should, you're victim blaming now. Or you're saying that if, 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 if you're an IA, if yeah. the patients had to wear, you know, the scuba diving suits. Encased mm. in neoprene, there'd be a lot less chance for some problems. If you were aroused in A&E, mm. you've got lots of problems <laughs> and should be asked to leave. Yeah. And and it might, it has might, anyone been aroused in A&E? It might be the reason you're in A&E in the first place. <laughs> uh, moving on, we've got the mail now, and teenagers are choking each other with sadly predictable consequences, Josh. 
Yeah, disturbing rise in teenage boys demanding rough sex and choking girls as young as 12. This is a uh, study in America. They interviewed 5,000 women, and it found that 40% of, of, of when they were 12 to 17 had been choked mm. during se sexual activity. Uh, 12 year olds. Uh, yeah, well, 12 to 17. Yeah, but they shouldn't be having sex. No, no, of course not. But, but yeah, but that's what it is. And, it, and a few years ago, it was 25%. Now it's gone up to 40%. Yeah. This is the prevalence of, obviously, that, that activity in pornography. Children are watching it uh, younger and younger. The average age is 12. Because when I, when I log on to, to watch it, it pops up the little box and it says, are you 18 or over? Yeah. And it, you can't get yes, through no, unless, not unless, you're, you're, unless yes. you're over 18 and you say yes. Yeah, yeah it's, so a, it's, it's a real... Point, point there. It's, it's a tricky one. I think the most telling old <laughs> part of this as well is also this... Um, they, this person, they did a Q&A in 2020 and they said a 16-year-old girl came up afterwards and said, how come all boys want to choke you? And then a 15-year-old came up to... Boy came up to her later yeah. and said, "Why do all girls want to be choked?" <laughs> so I think there is an obvious miscommunication of yeah. boys watching porn and young women watching porn, and it's stuff. There's also yeah. songs and various things in popular culture and TikTok, and having this misidea because boys, you've got to remember, are idiots, <laughs> and they just they actually just want to do good, and you can totally see that they yeah. think, "Oh, this is normal. This I'm just trying to." Be a man here, and, right. and then they've got the wrong end of the stick, and this is literally, the, literally, yeah. And this I mean, is Paul. What, what do you what goes. do you make of this? Do you think we're well? It's the prevalence of pornography, right. and it's because it's on devices now. Is it? It's freely available right. to anyone with a phone. Yeah. We all yeah. had to forage in the woods yeah. for scraps. <laughs> yeah. But then there was no choking involved in that. Yeah. The, the worst we, the closest we got to this was uh, you've been tangled, where you just slap somebody in the side of the head. And I, I, I mean, I don't think. Within the story, it does say the idea of choking as part of a sexual act has been around since the 1600s. I'm not sure exactly how they know that, whether it was in uh, uh, Shakespeare or whatever. Yeah. I, don't, I don't remember that. But um, to choke or not to choke? Yeah, that is <laughs> that is the uh, the question. Okay, well that's it for part two. But coming up, we've got sailors who can't swim, Germans who can't drive, and politeness is now illegal. See you in a couple of minutes. Good evening. Here's your latest GB News weather update from the Met Office. Showers for many of us this weekend, but towards the southeast, something a little bit drier, and that's because we have high pressure dominating over the near continent. Further north, though, a frontal system is pushing its way through, and that's going to bring some further outbreaks of rain across some parts of Scotland into northern England as we go through the night. Also, some strong gusty winds and a few showers towards the northwest of Scotland, but elsewhere, largely dry as we go through the early hours of Saturday morning and some clear skies, but despite these temperatures not dropping a huge amount. A touch cooler than last night, but a relatively mild start on Saturday nonetheless. First thing, there could be some murkiness, some low cloud perhaps around English Channel coastal parts, but otherwise, particularly towards the southeast, it's going to be a largely fine day. Decent amount of sunshine, a bit more cloud and some rain across northern and western parts of England and Wales. Nothing heavy here. The heaviest downpours likely across parts of Scotland could be some gusty winds here too. Temperatures will be down a nudge compared to today, but still a little bit above average for the time of year. Into Sunday, and it is going to be a fresher day for all of us. There will be plenty of showers piling in across parts of Northern Ireland and particularly Scotland. Some heavy, some thundery, could be some hail mixed in. Further south and east across the bulk of England and Wales, it's actually looking like a largely dry day with some decent sunshine. More showers to come as we go through Monday and to Tuesday, but it is going to be noticeably fresher than it has been of late. Bye-bye. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Headliners. The Telegraph now with the worrying news that basic politeness is criminalised by equality laws, Paul. About time to. Uh, <laughs> offering a chair to an older worker colleague, older work colleague, could break equality laws. And I'd like to say at this point, I would never offer a chair to Lewis Schaefer. Um, being given an opportunity... <laughs> I would, to, so, around yeah. the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lewis. Uh, gi being given an opportunity to sit while younger staff stand may amount to age discrimination, and this is because of a tribunal. Now, the ruling came uh, in the case of a 66-year-old uh, at a recycling plant. He was an operative, and it, it, he brought it because he was asked if he'd like to take a seat by a younger member of staff, and he took umbrage to this, and he sued them. Mm. The it's been proven that um, he, there was no malice involved, but it, it, it has also been said that it was unwanted conduct, which really does leave the door open. Yeah. And, do you know, I'd sack... I'd sack the person just for bringing that lawsuit. Well, yeah, and the, reading... I, I just couldn't... Honestly, I was, that, someone like that does not deserve to be... Well, I think in. that well, point read... was they were sacked, and reading that's the... why they did the lawsuit. Reading the, the transcript, yeah. reading, reading what actually happened, uh, so uh, Idris Buemo, the, the manager, asked him if he wanted a chair when he hadn't asked for one. That just sounds like sort of basic politeness, and so Mr Idrero, who you know was, was the complainant, replied that he did not want one, and Mr Buemo didn't give a reason for the offer, although there was nothing unpleasant or rude about the way he asked the question. I mean, that's just... Somebody being nice. Well, it's more than that because the, 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 he'd had surgery. Right. So he had health issues. He yeah. was moving to a new department. But this guy had this kind of conspiracy theory idea, whether it was valid or not, that they were trying to get people to retire by 66 and he right. was 66 and so they were kind of trying. And they did uh, then, they sort of said that he'd left um, like, and they kind of fired him, basically, because yeah. he was off sick. I, I, was something like, I don't know, whatever. Take all of that back. But the point is... <laughs> <laughs> you, you should have been a liar. I can imagine you seeing this in court. But, um, but, yeah, this is ridiculous, and it is slightly scary that they're saying that to, to offer someone, an, old, an elder, elderly person, a chair would be to treat them... Disadvantaged. Yeah, when it's giving them an advantage. Well, let's not forget that we've created an environment now where this guy thinks he can do that. Yeah. So he can sue because of that. He, he's taking advantage. Like, like, so like Josh rightly points out, this is a guy that's kind of uh, sees himself as a victim in the situation yeah. and has taken this avenue. So we've, we've opened the door to vexatious accusations. Can of... you imagine that in Scotland? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> it's all the police will deal with. <laughs> Are they independent now? And Royal Navy recruits will no longer have to be able to swim. Seems a bit daft, but on the plus side, I guess they'll work extra hard to make sure the ship doesn't sink, Paul. Well, a Navy recruit's no longer required to swim in desperate bid to boost applications. Now, this is because... This is largely because now, of course, people don't want to join the armed forces. Mm. They don't want to join the armed forces because no-one's really been uh, brought up anymore in an environment where they think that's a valid option. Yeah. You know, it requires a certain level of patriotism. Oh, patriotism's try... illegal now. That's and, like and offering that's, somebody yeah, a cheer. Exactly. I mean... I'm not too sure, though, that swimming is that much of a big deal in the Navy, because if you're 1,500 miles from land, unless you've got your 1,500 miles... you've got miles to be to really good at swimming. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, very... You just get to swim for a bit until somebody picks you up. If you can swim that far, don't join the, don't join the Navy, I say, just starting up an Olympic sport. Um, they can't drive boats either, most of these people. You know, right. I mean, where do you, where do you draw the line? I know they don't call them boats. I know they don't call it driving. I'd like to apologise to everybody in Portsmouth. But <laughs> it, it, to me, it, the only problem that, that could be seen with this is that you ha they're saying that they will train them when they're onboarded. Yeah. Therefore, it's at the taxpayer expense. So within this article, within the independent article, they're saying people that are commenting on it are saying, well, why don't they just learn to swim before yeah. they join and make it? I mean, Josh, do you think we could just give them water wings? 
Yeah, that would be a massive help. <laughs> Just yeah. a woggle. <laughs> but, but maybe this also speaks to the fact that there is... I'm sorry, I don't want to get all boring here, but there are less resources out there in the, in the public space. Schools closing down their swimming pools, closing down access... Schools have swimming pools? Well, some of them used to, Josh believe it or not, and they had access to swimming My pools to be able to use it. We, I we, believe there's, you elite, there's a river. They pulled back <laughs> the, the... You know, used to get more swimming days... Uh, so less people know how to swim. So, but yeah, as that's you a said, good point. That they're not actually saying that when you're in the navy, you don't know how have to know how to swim. They're just saying that you would learn if you didn't know, you would learn on the training. Yeah, right. Than Which yeah. and but the thing that is also makes this whole story moot is they're saying they're doing that to recruit more people because it was an historical low. Yeah. Then they say, oh, by the way, applications are at an eight-year high. So then I don't understand what the need was. That's because the, the people who can't swim have all signed up. We're moving on. We've got the mail now. And the RSPCA have released a video telling people not to kill animals. And some donors are furious. Did they not know what the RSPCA does, Paul? <laughs> well... That's a good question. I don't think they do. RSPCA's widely woke rebrand as charity infuriates farmers and slams Brits killing snails. Uh, how donors stopped giving after years of ludicrous rescues, uh, which have seen seagulls saved and mountain goats rescued from mountains. Um, look. <laughs> this, this is all about. This story is really about woke. Okay, a lot like the same applies to the National Trust and a lot of things like that. And the thing about woke is, you can easily like the, you know News Thump. They see News Thump when it first came out. Do you remember News Thump? It was something on Facebook. They, they, they were funny, and then they decided that they they'd be on the side of social injustice. Oh, and they got a message. And now they say things like you know, and now they give you the definition of woke on a mug or a t-shirt. Like you're going to wear that out. <laughs> but if you've got that on. I don't care if you're woke, you're not cool. Maybe be some a, people... that, it's not that. They'd be a, you'd be, that'd be a red flag. You just get yeah, beat. You you are, you'd maybe be a date some rapist. people want to be, want to be bullied at school. But my point is, that. these people aren't against injustice. They're just very supercilious But this idiots. doesn't seem... We're, show, we're showing some of the scenes from the video oh. now, and this doesn't seem uh, woke. This just seems... Like, the RSPCA stands for preventing cruelty to animals, so mm. they're showing some animals and cruel situations that they're in. I mean, these are chickens that aren't having a great time because uh, they're, they're in a farm, and then, you know, they're going to end up in mad dinner later. So, mm. I mean, this, this seems fair but enough. It, but it's the traditional idea of the RSPCA, I think a lot of people think of it as, like, basically preventing cruelty for dogs and cats. Oh, and and pets. Not, oh, and so the nice ger animals. Ger yeah, the gerbils at the bottom. Well, gerbils understand. Gerbils <laughs> the bottom. That's, that's, that's an urban myth, by the way. There's no way you'd put a gerbil up your up your. We'll talk. No. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're You're they're right. There's no vicious. way you should. Oh, they're okay. no, they, they, they'd literally shred you from the inside. Oh yeah. Like the alien. Yeah, yeah. You're, You're not going to look tell. Eric, yeah. are, the... <laughs> are, you, are you a member of the RSPCA? All I'm saying is there there are okay. other marsupials I can okay. recommend. Okay. Fine. Good to know. Um, but. <laughs> There's, there's another issue here raised that it turns out that the RSPCA, they've received um, Lots. three and a half million from the uh, lottery. Right. And they've spent 75% or 74% of their money goes on administration and expenses. Right. And then you have what money they are spending saving animals being a thousand pounds to, to save some um, seagull from a roof. And then they saved the seagull and then the seagull just flew off. <laughs> I was like, that, how are you, what are you doing here? Yeah, well, that's, it can only fly because it got down off that and roof. This, this it is, was scared of heights. It's a rebrand. This is the first time they've been rebranded since the 1970s. They've right. done this rebrand. They've bought in this firm that have kind of gone, hey, let's bring in all these oh, other animals God. and whatnot. And this is the result. Stick to cats, dogs, gerbils. Yeah, the animals that people like, not seagulls. Everybody hates seagulls. Moving on, we've got the Telegraph now with a ban on the auto ban, Josh. And a German transport minister warns of weekend driving ban and saying, yes, that they would... One of the things might have to be a speed limit on the nation's autobahns, which is... That's the best thing about Germany. That's their sort of big cultural accomplishment, mm. is uh, you can drive as fast as you like. Yeah. Uh, but to, to meet the net zero targets, he's saying that it's basically going to be impossible unless they change the law to make uh, the driving... Um, put that outside of the rest of it. And as long as Germany as a whole meets its targets, <clears throat> then they can still... should be able to drive. But so the Greens are saying no. So they're going to ban driving at the weekend just to meet some spurious net zero law. This sounds like communism. You absolutely hit the nail on the head from my perspective. I mean, because the other solution, of course, is to scrap the arbitrary net zero targets yeah. so that your people can drive at the weekend. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine this? If, if we'd written this satirically ten years yeah. ago, this would have been a lovely sitcom yeah. about how the Germans stop people driving at the weekend in order to meet some ridiculous target. Now, this is pure reality, yeah. and people are 
definitely concerned about meeting this target and will do almost anything to make sure that we do. And I'm not sure that it is worth the effort. Well, I'm not saying that we should. I'm not saying we should neglect the planet. This is the problem with this. This whole thing is that you, if you say that you should change the target in some way, they're saying, well, you just want everyone to die. Of course we don't. Yeah. But we've got to live here whilst we're saving well, the planet. And particularly in Germany, because East Germany obviously was actually communist, and one of the rules they had under that, if you wanted to buy a, a car for your own use, a personal car, uh, you had to wait years and years. It was a terrible car. It was a Trabant, and uh, and then you were put on a list as somebody who, uh, you know, basically wanted to choose their own route instead of taking the, the public transport that was the government telling you where yeah. you could go. And that made you a dangerous person, potential dissident. So, you know, this, this, this has the Stasi, uh, the fingerprints of the Stasi all over it. And the, the fingerprints of the Stasi are basically all over uh, net zero policy and the 15-minute cities and, and all that kind of stuff. We're, we're slowly, we're slowly creeping into a really rubbish version of East German communism. Anyway, that's it for part Part three, uh, but stay with us for the final section with fake disabled people at Disneyland, angry monkeys and something unusual in Uranus. You won't want to miss that. We've got a picture. See you in a couple of minutes. <laughs> mm. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6am. I don't think you can go and watch a Shakespeare play unless you already know it. It's yes. almost like you have to understand the story, story. and the characters yeah. and perhaps have even done a bit of reading into it. Because if you went completely blind, especially in today's world where we don't speak in that kind of way, um, it is, I think, probably a bit alienating. But don't don't is saying it is alienating at the moment because of the lack of uh, representation. I, you know what, the actual phrasing they use, right, OK. The disproportionate representation um, propagated white able Bodied, heterosexual, cisgender, male narratives. I'm sure there's people sitting in a room going, what's the most ridiculous thing we can come up with today? Yes. But are really, just chuck all these words at it, cisgender, and it's just insane. Mm. Of course, Shakespeare was what it was back in the day, and that's why it is, it's mostly blokes and they're mostly white. And lots of speculation that he was actually gay, isn't there? Because he never really saw Anne Hathaway very often and stayed away a lot of the time. I don't know, he, maybe he was a big He might have been transgender icon. for all I, I know. know. I mean, I, I don't... I... <laughs> Begins, I'm looking at you. No, I think you're right. I mean, you know, I think uh, that goes for the profession too. Mm. Mm. Uh, I mean, it, it's... Uh, I, I, I do think we... I mean, I remember seeing Macbeth in London with Judi Dench and Ian McKellen, and it was one of the most exciting wow. evenings ever. And it was a cold night in the Donmar Theatre, outside and inside, and it, that gave it atmosphere. There are certain things, and then you go along and see something else, and you think, I'll walk out in the interval. Yeah. Macbeth is, is so a bad. sexy play, though. Let's talk about... Um, oh, there's so many. Can I live to be 100? Oh, um, this is depressing. I think it is depressing. Oh. I like to stay here and now. I don't want to live to 100. Oh, don't and say I'm that. right behind you. I don't you. even want to. My father died at 63. That'll be me gone this year. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Headliners. We've got the Metro now, and scientists have found something unusual in Uranus. Josh, could you pull it out and show us? No, it's a gerbil. <laughs> Uranus, Uranus has something expect, unexpected deep inside it. The whole purpose of this story was to do the headline. Yeah, yeah. And now we'll move on to... There's, the, there's a story like this there is about Uranus every week. I just know. so they can do that headline. That's all it is. Uh, 
basically boffins. No, it's actually this is scientists have uh, from looking at Voyager went past it, and essentially when the when the solar system was being formed, um, gaseous planets were kind of being created, sucked in matter, and that matter, some of it then reacted to this methane to create uh, methane bit like like a sort of not not even like a solid like a sort of spongy thing and water so what basically uranus is methane and water i know that and <laughs> we are gonna go, <laughs> and we're gonna go there and i imagine we're gonna plunder it right because we need those things we're going to plunder uranus <laughs> <laughs> i can't believe you did my joke <laughs> All of that set up, and I didn't even get the punchline. I'm sorry, mate. We've done I'm that sorry, joke. I'm sorry. We've done that joke about 15 times in that story. <laughs> Moving on, we've got the Telegraph with bad news for anyone who shaves their kids' heads to skip the queue at Disneyland. Pop. Good Ooh. grief! <laughs> Disneyland clamps down on visitors who pretend to be disabled to jump queues. Disneyland has announced it is overhauling its rules because visitors are abusing the system by pretending to be disabled in order to skip the lengthy queues. And this, and this was a plot line in the office. It, was, it absolutely was. And of course, you know, with 99% of disabilities being invisible, this is a very difficult job, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. But surely the invisible ones probably don't, you know... Need to queue jump. Yeah, you don't need to queue jump if it's an invisible... Well, if you feel sad, you might want to get to the front. Yeah. <laughs> but it has... It's tripled in the last five years, the, the right. queues. So they had to do something. Hmm. People obviously were abusing the system, but then at the same time, you've had mental health issues also yeah. tripling during that time. And people... and that Because it's not what we would traditionally think as, as disabled people and wheelchairs and whatnot who can't queue up, uh, who, who need a bit of help. And also, when it, this is their family time out, yeah. but you've got people who are sort of saying, oh, they have mental issues that they can't handle being in a queue for an hour and a half. Well, try queuing up with five kids yeah. for an hour and, and also, see what how do you think you're going like? to cope with a roller coaster? If you don't like the queue, the roller coaster goes upside down, and it's basically a queue that you can't get out of. Yes. I did thought part this week, actually. Was it fun? It was... Do uh, you know, I went on all of the scary rides. This is not necessarily my thing, but you do queue a lot. I loved it, by the way. It's exhilarating, and uh, there are other amusement parks uh, um, available. And I'd like to go to them free, so if uh, you're interested in sending me tickets, that's cool. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, Sorry, what were we doing? And, yeah. and I, I, but, I mean, how difficult... This is difficult, isn't it? Because there was a time when it was clearly obvious... Yeah. Um, why somebody was being fast-tracked. Mm. And that's fantastic, mm. because they've been giving an opportunity. Now, of course, I do understand the point of my little anecdote was that, you know, I did queue for an hour here and an hour there, and you'll spend, you know, so much money, and all day you'll get on about five rides, because, you know, six or seven hours of that can be queuing. So yeah. I understand what the problem is. But the other way to get around it is to pay fast-track. Yeah. Yeah, you can do fast-track. Yeah, yeah, you can. With when your the, mental, when mental there's loads money. of you. But I was going to say, I believe this is... I believe Ken Loach is going to be doing uh, a movie <laughs> about this about oh, them, because now because they're going to be questioning people's disabilities and so someone <laughs> right. yeah i daniel blake uh wants yeah. to go to disney, to disney. Yeah. <laughs> we've got the guardian now and apparently the lead singer of u2 is surprisingly violent josh yeah, Bono, Bono <laughs> Boz, Bono Boz, that's the Bono Boz, uh, Bono, yeah, that's what, I've never heard of Bono Boz, do you know, have you Bonobos? heard of Bonobos? Bonobos, yeah. Bonobos, I don't know Bonobos, mm. I feel like an idiot, as like always. You're I know a lot about Bonobos, I didn't, I've never even heard of, you, like, that was a joke, but no, I they, so. they have, oh. a, they're, because uh, chimpanzees, like, basically different uh, primates have, have different uh, mating rituals, but we're yeah. going anyway, to, can you get them up your bottom? Anyway, Bonobos are not the peace-loving primates, primates that once thought study reveals. I didn't even know what that they existed, so yeah. I really didn't know that. And uh, we know that, that, that there's this thing that chimpanzees can be actually very violent, kill, oh, yeah. maim, sexual assault. Eat touch, eat each other, as well as, as, well as, as their, their prey. Prey. So, but it turns out these bonobos, hopefully pronouncing that right, uh, they are more aggressive towards each other, but they are not aggressive towards female bonobos, so maybe they should go and work in the NHS and help out those issues, if you yeah. were watching earlier. Great idea. Well, let's just squeeze in one more story. We've got the mail now, and clocks in the Arctic are apparently designed by Spinal Tap. They go all the way up to 13. <laughs> it's an incredible story, this. Uh, there's a really amusing part to this story as well. I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, Norway's Arctic North wants to bring in a 26-hour day. Bizarre plan would see clocks go up to 13 instead of 12. And they spoke to the guy that brought this in, and he said, when asked how this could be achieved, because obviously that's what you want to know, how can this be achieved, she said that the clock would go up to 13. She... <laughs> 
<laughs> so I don't think it was important. But uh, I, I did uh, emphasise it, didn't I? The clock would go up from 13, but added, I don't think they're going to say yes, so we haven't thought about all the details. So yeah. she's basically said, I'm the ideas person. But yeah. she's, she's saying it will give people more time in the day <laughs> to do fishing. Of it's like, yeah, it doesn't make more time. You've just changed the numbers. No, 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 no you're wrong, because what she's <laughs> going to do... So I don't want to come across as all Lewis Schaefer here. <laughs> but, yeah, all they've got to do is make an hour down to, like, 50 minutes. Yeah. I, I haven't done the, done the maths yet. You and make an hour faster. Yeah, you make an you hour 50 time. minutes or you make seconds slightly quicker yeah. and then you will get 13 <laughs> hours. So you will get a longer day. So I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I Gosh. think... I think this is ridiculous. And I yeah. think also, I don't think we should put the clocks backwards and forwards in Britain. It's very confusing and I don't like it. I like it just being brighter all year round. That'd be oh. better. Anyway, the show <laughs> is nearly over. So let's take another quick look at Saturday's front pages. The Daily Mail has Rayner. I'll quit if I'm found guilty. The I Weekend has UK intelligence officials targeted in honey trap sex plots by Chinese spies. The Guardian leads with End cruel prosecution of carers, Sunak urged. The Sun has Nightmare. Gordon Ramsay's pub is being squatted. The Telegraph has Rayner. I will quit if guilty over house row. And the Times has pressure on Starmer as police look into deputy. And those we are front pages. And that's all we have time for. Thank you to my guests, Josh Howie and Paul Cox. We're back tomorrow at 11pm when Nick Dixon will be joined by Jonathan Cogan and Cressida Wetton. And if you're watching at 5am, stay tuned for breakfast. Good night. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good evening. Here's your latest GB News weather update from the Met Office. Showers for many of us this weekend, but towards the southeast, something a little bit drier, and that's because we have high pressure dominating over the near continent. Further north, though, a frontal system is pushing its way through, and that's going to bring some further outbreaks of rain across some parts of Scotland into northern England as we go through the night. Also, some strong gusty winds and a few showers towards the northwest of Scotland, but elsewhere largely dry as we go through the early hours of Saturday morning and some clear skies, but despite these temperatures not dropping a huge amount. A touch cooler than last night, but a relatively mild start on Saturday nonetheless. First thing, there could be some murkiness, some low cloud perhaps around English Channel coastal parts, but otherwise, particularly towards the southeast, it's going to be a largely fine day. Decent amount of sunshine, a bit more cloud and some rain across northern and western parts of England and Wales. Nothing heavy here. The heaviest downpours likely across parts of Scotland could be some gusty winds here too. Temperatures will be down a nudge compared to today, but still a little bit above average for the time of year. Into Sunday, and it is going to be a fresher day for all of us. There will be plenty of showers piling in across parts of Northern Ireland and particularly Scotland. Some heavy, some thundery, could be some hail mixed in. Further south and east across the bulk of England and Wales, it's actually looking like a largely dry day with some decent sunshine. More showers to come as we go through Monday and to Tuesday, but it is going to be noticeably fresher than it has been of late. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel treats for another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Nana Aquir. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome to Lee Anderson's Real World. We've got a cracking lineup tonight. We've got Bill Etheridge, former UKIP MEP. Matthew Stadlin, political commentator, is our left in the corner. He's going to be going head to head with Benedict Spence. We're going to go back in the day with former Wilfred Emmanuel Jones. We've also got glamour model Daniel Mason. But first, let's go to the news. Good evening, the top stories this hour. Angela Rayner says she'll step down if it's determined that she committed a criminal offence over her tax affairs. It's over the sale of her council house in Stockport a decade ago. Questions have been asked about whether she paid the right amount of tax and if it was her main home. In a statement, Angela Rayner said the questions raised relate to a time before she was an MP and that she's taken expert tax and legal advice. Sir Keir Starmer says Labour welcomes the investigation. We welcome this investigation because it will allow a line to be drawn in relation to this matter. Um, I am fully confident that Andrew Rayner has not broken the rules. She will cooperate with the investigation as you would expect uh, and it's really a matter for the police. The former chief executive of Royal Mail says he doesn't know if money paid by sub-postmasters who were wrongly accused of stealing was recorded as profit. Adam Crozier told the Horizon Inquiry this afternoon that he assumed the money was accounted for by the company's financial team, but admitted that he couldn't be sure. He also said he was not aware that lawyers within the Royal Mail Group conducted prosecutions and conceded that sub-postmasters should not have been treated as thieves. Energy Minister Graeme Stewart has announced he's standing down from his cabinet role to focus on local issues. The Beverly and Holden SNP said he plans to focus on issues such as making roads safer, broadband delivery and increasing the number of defibrillators in his constituency. Justin Tomlinson now takes on the role of Minister for, Minister for Energy Security and Net Zero. A man who attacked and killed another man with a serrated hunting knife in a Cornwall nightclub has been sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 23 years. Jake Hill also injured four others in just 20 seconds outside the Eclipse nightclub, causing fatal wounds to 32-year-old Michael 
Radio Allen, who intervened to protect others. The judge praised the victim's bravery, calling him a man of exceptional qualities. 22-year-old Tia Taylor also received a three-year sentence for manslaughter and 23-year-old Chelsea Powell was jailed for 15 months for perverting the course of justice. A passenger on a tram who was involved in a struggle with a knife-wielding attacker has been found not guilty of criminal charges. Police say Kyle Knowles, who was 32, was armed with a knife when he boarded a tram in Nottingham in June last year. He then launched an unprovoked attack on a passenger, causing serious knife wounds. However, the alleged attacker was himself fatally stabbed during the struggle. Nottinghamshire police arrested the passenger on suspicion of murder shortly after the tram came to a stop. They have now concluded that he acted in self-defence. A 23-year-old man has denied murdering a good Samaritan who died as she tried to help a stranger. 46-year-old Chris Marriott, who was on a post-Christmas walk with his wife and two young children, when he stopped to help a woman who was unconscious in the street. He was killed when a car ploughed into a small crowd following a disturbance in the Burngreave area of Sheffield. Hassan Janga denied the murder and manslaughter of Mr Marriott, but pleaded guilty to causing his death by dangerous driving. There are serious shortcomings in the Bank of England's economic forecasting methods, according to a report by former chair of the US Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke. It found staff were using out-of-date software with functions that could be automated, often performed manually. It comes after several of the bank's forecasts were repeatedly inaccurate during a period of economic turbulence. The price of a cup of coffee is on the rise. Arabica beans hit an 18-month peak. Both Vietnam, which is the world's largest supplier of Robusta beans, and Brazil, the top producer of Arabica coffee, have been hit by poor weather, stoking fears of a supply shortage, with both varieties rising sharply since the start of the year. Coffee roasters in Europe also say that supply chain issues are having an impact complicated by Houthi attacks on commercial shipping. It comes after poor weather helped push up the price of cocoa shortly before the Easter holiday. And researchers have discovered the cause of the brightest burst of light ever recorded. The luminous burst of light, which, burst of light, which occurred more than two billion light years from Earth and lasted just seconds, was so bright it was said to have blinded space instruments. The findings published in the journal Nature Astrology suggest boats' likely origin is an explosion or supernova that came after the collapse of a massive star. For the latest story, sign up to GB News Alert by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Welcome to Lee Anderson's Real World and joining me tonight for a lively debate is Bill Etheridge, former UKIP MEP and back has left in the corner for about the tenth time. <laughs> got Matthew Stadlin, thanks. He's a bit of a secret Tory, but he's not let on to that yet. Listen, ECHR guys this week poking their long noses into our business once again. They are, uh, they are demanding that we do more on climate change and saying it's a breach of our human rights, complaining, I think a bunch of old ladies went over to, from Switzerland, complaining about heat waves. Looking at the weather out there, I think we could do a bit of a heat wave at the moment. We'll give our tourist industry a boost, especially in places like Skegness, where I go for my holidays. But, Bill... Is this a step too far? Should they butt out and should we leave the ECHR? We should have left the ECHR years ago. The whole concept is about keeping a shared space of European laws and values. We voted for Brexit. Now, if you say to the people in the streets, we voted for Brexit, but we're going to maintain a shared space of European laws and values, they say, what are you talking about? What's the whole point of it? And when you get judges in place who are appointed by the elites, and you put them into a lovely sounding thing, European Court of Human Rights. It sounds fluffy, but actually it's polishing a turd. The reality is they are there to suppress the wishes and the views of democratically elected governments and people. We should have nothing to do with it, and any human rights we need in this country, we can do our own Bill of Rights. There we go, Matthew. Own Bill of Rights, which covers pretty much everything that's in the ECHR. Why can't we do that? Well, your former boss, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, 
He's been describing the ECHR as a foreign court. It's not, it's an international court. And I'm actually proud as a proud Brit myself. Well, it is a foreign court. Well, no, it's, it's an international it's court. In Strasbourg, that's it's, in a foreign country. It's, a, it's an international court. We subscribe to it. We help one of our greatest Britons of all Here time. We well, Winston Churchill. Well, well, it's true, isn't it? It might be this painful. This is like 80 years ago, Martin. <laughs> it might be Holocaust. painful for you to recognise, but actually Winston Churchill was instrumental in the setting up of this court. Now, why should we stay a part of this convention? I think we should stay a part of it because it helps to protect us against the excesses of our own government. It protects the rights to liberty, to freedom of thought, to freedom of what? speech, Have you been to freedom Scotland of lately? life. It's, it's there to protect fair and free elections. What is not to like about uh, that? Listen, I'm, I'm sorry, Matthew, but it's a lot of nonsense. Freedom of thought. Have you been to Scotland in this past week when at about 5,000? Well, you could take the Scottish government to, to court then, couldn't you? You could go to the ECHR and defend your own rights, Lee. That's the point. I wonder whose side they'd be on. Well, we have to wait. Come on, on, Billy. No. Come on, Billy. Yeah. You've got to come back on. Well, that. I, I, I do need to. Yeah, Churchill was involved in it, but it was 80 years ago. The whole, I think he would be spinning like a top and taking off yeah. from his grave if he knew what it was about now. And you say protecting us from the excesses of our own government. We can vote for our own government. Now, yeah, we do. Uh, our government plays a part in putting these people in place as judges. Yeah. But this is the elite and establishment putting people in place to protect their values. Oh, oh, if no, we no, want to vote for something, why can't we vote for something? Bill, you say these judges, are these qualified judges? Well, they're qualified to be politically correct and they've got the right views and they pass the criteria of... Come on, guys, come on. Community. This is a bit like a pub conversation. I know we're in a well, pub. Let's, oh, be yeah. serious. Exactly Let's be serious for a moment. I don't know what either of you two guys... So I imagine you see yourselves as patriotic. I'm certainly patriotic. I don't know what it is that you guys like about Belarus or Putin and oh, Russia. We do we? <laughs> well, everything oh, I come Australia. up with, you say, oh, here we go. Australia isn't in Europe, Lee. Oh, exactly. The point about Putin and the point about Belarus is they are in Europe. And they are the countries that are not signed up to the ECHR. We don't want to become a state like those so guys. We, we don't want to side with them. Are you, are you genuinely saying, Matthew, that we could not have our own Bill of Rights and reform the Human Rights Act so it is much better and stronger and goes further than the ECHR? This is about... Are we not the, capable of is, doing that I'm sure in that place I'm, over there? I'm sure we are capable. The, well, there this you go. is to protect us against our own government if it infringes on our rights. You could have a democratically elected government that... That's does the key word, terrible, Matthew, let me democratic Yes, I, of course, and I'm a Democrat, and I could understand, by the way, although I voted... But you're not a Democrat. Well, well hang on. Although I voted to, to remain, I understood the point about the remoteness of European democracy. I understood that was a reasonable argument, in my view, for leaving the EU. But the point is, you can have a democracy that actually then goes after minorities and, and, and in, in an illegal way. And this ECHR business is what helps to protect us in those circumstances. It's actually really important. So it's, this cause is to protect us from our own mistakes of voting for our choice of government. Let's so imagine, it's, it's let's to imagine our government. Us from our own view. But let's so take this seriously. It's a serious point. Let, I'm, I'm half Jewish, right? Let's say that we had a, a, a democratically elected government that went after Jews. In those circumstances, the ECHR would help to protect me as a Jewish person. Let's say they went after people from Nottingham. Yeah. You could say, well, it's democratically elected, so it should have... The ECHR is an important international checks you know, you and balance what? system it, on that. In that fluffy world that you live in, Matthew, that might be all well and good, but the ECHR are not doing much to protect the Jewish people that are feeling threatened and intimidated on Parliament Square when we have these vile, nasty, you know, these pro-Palestinian marches. What are the ECHR doing then? The police are there oh, to protect go. these people. Well, of course they are. They're there to protect... The and I would be the first to say, if the police or individual police officers get it wrongly, then I would condemn them. But I don't think it's for the ECHR to come and tell our police exactly how to do but that. But for the ECHR to tell us and Switzerland, for example, that we're not pursuing climate change agendas rapidly enough because they think we're victimising our own people. Have they taken into account that this climate change agenda, this net zero madness, will actually plunge hundreds of thousands of people into poverty? How about the human rights of those I people? Could understand they are the sticking to the agenda Listen, of guys, the elite. I could, I could understand the frustrations of the feeling of overreach on the part of the ECHR. <laughs> and no institution is, is perfect. You say this climate change nonsense, the overwhelming majority of international scientists 
scientific opinion no, is that uh, climate yeah. change is real. Why, you guys, who, why are you guys groaning? The, Let's be adult about this. When you say follow, we've heard this, follow the science. We heard this for the last few years. Follow who funds the science is far more important. A scientist, much like anyone else, will come up with a conclusion based around who funds them. So you don't we have this you think international science is corrupt, do you? I think anything that has large amounts of money going Where's your might be swayed. What report are you showing me that international science is corrupt and that they are leading us into some sort of net zero conspiracy which is designed to make poorer people poorer? Come on, guys. It's designed to make rich people richer. Well, let, 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 let me chip in here. I feel a little bit isolated here, Bill. Let, let, if we're going to talk about net zero, Matthew, let's talk about some facts. You know, and I've said it before on this show. If this country of ours sunk into the, into the sea tonight, and everything went out, the lights went out, everything closed down, it would not make a blind bit of difference to this planet in carbon emissions. None Less whatsoever. than 1%. It wouldn't make any difference whatsoever. So you've got these unelected officials, and they are unelected, dictating to us in this country. And can you understand, Matthew, why, after we've left the European Union, when we get unelected officials telling us what to do, why people in places like Ashfield, where I represent, are absolutely furious? Let me explain to you. So you've got a drug dealer down the corner of the road, and I've got no time for drug dealers. So the drug dealer says, well, there's, I might as well carry on selling my drugs, because if I don't sell the drugs, someone else is going to sell the drugs. The point is, how can we possibly, and we, are, we should be leaders in the world, because we are a great country, we've got a great history, we've got the sixth biggest economy or whatever it is in the world, we actually still do have something of an international reputation. How can we possibly go and lobby China and India and elsewhere and say you've got to be doing more on climate change if we throw our own climate change goals out the window? We've got to, be, we've got to stand up and be grown up. Do you think they take any notice when we lobby them, when we tell them, by the way, we had our own fantastic industrial era that got us great standards of living, by the way, you emerging nations, your economy... We can put our heads in the sand. Yeah. You're, you're very sure. we, look, we can put our heads in the sand and pretend climate change isn't real, that it's all a hoax and we can't make any impact. We can do that, and the people who will suffer are our children, our grandchildren and so forth. But no-one says climate change isn't real. It it's is It's the real. amount of man-made climate... That well, man, of this course thing. it is, because we put cows in the fields that, that give off this methane when they, <laughs> when they fart. We've, we, we have carbon emissions that are through the roof around the world. We know that this is... Science tells us this yeah. is having an impact on the climate. Lee, you said you started off with a joke, and this isn't a laughing matter, actually. You said, oh, well, we could do with a bit of climate change because it's not very hot outside the window. Come on. You, you, you know that that is not about climate change. You might have an individual period of cooler weather or whatever it is. That doesn't mean the facts aren't staring us in the face. The world is getting warmer and we are contributing. So it's raining outside, Bill. That's the cow's fault. Absolutely. So let's blame all the moo cows up and down the country. Better stop eating beef, haven't we? Yeah, stop eating beef. Shall we do that as well, Matthew? Well, I think it would be a good idea if we ate a lot less beef. Do I still eat beef? Yes. Should I eat less beef? Yes. Bill, Matthew, thanks for a lively debate. But coming up next, we're going back in the day with farmer Wilfred Emmanuel Jones. That's a corker. Good evening. Here's your latest GB News weather update from the Met Office. Showers for many of us this weekend, but towards the southeast, something a little bit drier, and that's because we have high pressure dominating over the near continent. Further north, though, a frontal system is pushing its way through, and that's going to bring some further outbreaks of rain across some parts of Scotland into northern England as we go through the night. Also, some strong gusty winds and a few showers towards the northwest of Scotland, but elsewhere, largely dry as we go through the early hours of Saturday morning, and some clear skies, but despite these temperatures not dropping a huge amount. A touch cooler than last night, but a relatively mild start on Saturday nonetheless. First thing, there could be some murkiness, some low cloud perhaps around English Channel coastal parts, but otherwise, particularly towards the southeast, it's going to be a largely fine day. Decent amount of sunshine, a bit more cloud and some rain across northern and western parts of England and Wales. Nothing heavy here. The heaviest downpours likely across parts of Scotland could be some gusty winds here too. Temperatures will be down a nudge compared to today, but still a little bit above average for the time of year. Into Sunday, and it is going to be a fresher day for all of us. There will be plenty of showers piling in across parts of Northern Ireland and particularly Scotland. Some heavy, some thundery, could be some hail mixed in. Further south and east across the bulk of England and Wales, it's actually looking like a largely dry day with some decent sunshine. More showers to come as we go through Monday and to Tuesday, but it is going to be noticeably fresher than it has been of late. Bye-bye.
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made what my I argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9pm only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Lee Anderson's Real World, and we're going back in the day now with Wilfred Emmanuel Jones. Welcome to the show. Well, it's yeah. nice to be here. It's, it's nice man. to meet the real man in, in real life, so thank you for inviting me. Now then, you, you've had a checkered life. You were uh, born in Jamaica in 1957, a little bit older than me, Wilfred, and you moved to the UK in 1961. I think you came after your parents. What was it like for you as a, as a young man coming to this great country of ours? Well, 
you can imagine as a four-year-old coming to this country. I could actually remember when I came here, it was in the winter. So it was the first time that I'd ever seen snow. Yeah. And it was a big culture shock because it would have been the first time that I'd seen my parents in, in three or four years. But that's the thing that happened um, in those days is that actually people like my parents decided to leave their country of birth to come to this country in order to further their lives yep. and the lives of their children. And one of the things I like to remind people of is this. It takes a real entrepreneurial minded person yep. to do that because for everyone who came, there's a lot of people who didn't because they didn't want to change their lives. So I'm really grateful that my parents had the courage to come here because it gave me all the opportunities that I then actually had. But it's courage and it's, it's a gamble as well. It's Robert. really, I just think, you know, I like to remind people from black backgrounds, look, you know, you've got to go and really celebrate your parents because yeah. it was a yeah. very courageous thing to do in order to give you yeah. an advantage, not for you to be a victim, yeah. is to give you an advantage. And so one of the things that makes me very, very cross is that actually over time with some people who develop this sort of victim culture, yeah. we're not victims. So I don't want to create stereotypes here, Wilfred, but every single person I speak to from Jamaica seem to have cooking in their blood. They've got a, a passion for cooking. Why is that? Well, actually, you're right. So um, the, uh, anybody from Jamaica would tell you about how fantastic they are with their foods. And if we had time, I could actually tell you about the origins and foods. And so jerk is what everybody would, yeah. um, would know about in, in, in um, the Jamaica. And the origins of jerk actually was from the slaves. So what would happen is that the slaves had a way of marinating yeah. the, the meats. So it actually could, quite, it could taste quite well. And, and they had to smoke it. So the, the, the slave hunters couldn't see the smoke. So that's, that, that's wow. the origins of those. Wow. Sort of, but then you of went one further and actually got a career doing this in, in TV. Well, actually, you know, um, my career has been in food. So I started off actually as a chef. Yep. And my claim to fame is that I gave people like Gordon Ramsay his first break because I went from being a chef. I then went to work in television as a producer, director, making yeah. food programs, traveling the world, making food um, shows. I then left the BBC and um, formed my own uh, food and drink marketing agency. Yeah. So I launched brands like Lloyd Gross and Sources, Kettle Chips, Smith Gin. And then I created my own brand, The Black Farm, when I bought my farm down yeah. in Devon. Let's talk about your farm. So okay. it's called the. the it's, it's, it's just. It's my farm. It's, I'm not going to give the address in case I get people coming down <laughs> there. But it's on the um, Devon Cornwall um, border. Yeah. I've had this farm now. It's coming up to about 28 years. Wow. So you can imagine 28 years ago um, buying this farm. Yep. And I can remember when I wanted to buy this farm. People say to me, well, why are you wanting to buy a farm down in Devon? You know, all this sort of metropolitan types are saying, well, don't they lynch black people down there? And one of the things I find really, really frustrating is there's this prejudice about people from rural Britain. Yeah. Even is, yeah. today, yeah, yeah. there's a massive prejudice, and, and it's based on people oh, have absolutely. And why no, is that, Wilfred? Well, it's based on naivety and, not, and people not having any real knowledge. Of what ignorance. It's, it's absolute ignorance. And I think the thing is, is that I feel safer being in rural Britain than I would be in, in urban Britain. Wow. You know, you know, you could rely and depend on your your neighbours. Yeah. You, you, you need to rely and depend on each other to be able to sort of. So you've gone from the kitchen. To the farm, yes. so you're going where it all starts, you know, where we grow our foods and, and, and rear our livestock, whatever. Yeah. But there's not many black farmers in this country. Why is that? The reality is this, is if you and I had to go out and buy land today, it's very, very expensive. Most people who own land, they haven't had to go and buy it. It's been passed down yep. through the generations. That's why you don't see many black people in, in, in farming, because it's a pretty expensive business. So one of the things that I really like to try and champion is that um, we need to get fresh blood in the, in the farming community. Yep. Definitely need to do that. And the way to do that is there is a lot of land that's owned by big institutions in this country, whether that's the Church of England, whether it's a national Good trust. Good and what I would like them to do is to go out and see, see, search for people from non-traditional farming black backgrounds mm -hmm and to give those people um, a helping hand to start into food and farming. So, Wilfred, there will be some people out there, a certain section of society, who, who spout this nonsense about the countryside is racist, maybe farming's racist because there's not many black farmers. How would you respond? Well, that? it's one of the things that really annoy me because, in my experience, that 
that isn't the case. And I think what happens is this. If you are a stranger, whether you're black, whether you're white, and you turn up into an area, people are going to look at you. It's like, well, what are you doing here? Because part of your security yeah. living in, the, in, in, in rural Britain is knowing your people. I've had people come down my lane, white people down my lane, and it automatically puts you on alert to think, well, you know, what are you doing? Here? Maybe they're lost. Yeah. I mean, only about, you know, a, a year ago, some Poles and Russians came down, and you're looking at them, what's going on? Because you don't look as though you're familiar. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm not going to um, say that actually racism doesn't exist. People do experience it, but I do think that rural Britain really gets unfairly treated. Mm -hmm. And it tends to be metropolitans who have this perception, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. intellectuals who have yeah, this perception yeah. the intellectual. that, that actually, that if you're black, you're going to have a, a, a difficult time. Yeah. You know, that isn't my experience, as I said. Yeah. What you really rely on is people that you know. The intellectuals, Wilfred, I mean, I call them the educated idiots. Uh, and there are, I mean, you've got a shop in, in Brixton. Yeah. Um, how would you get young black kids out of a place like Brixton, it's got yeah. its problems, we know yeah. it has, in, and, and get them interested in, in farming and have a great career. I always wanted to have a farm shop. And the, the decision that I made is that I wanted my first farm shop to be right in the heart of Brixton because it sends a very yeah. clear message that you can be black and also be part of rural Britain to be part of um, farming. So what you need, and this is what I say to a lot of black people, our parents were pioneers. They came to this country to give us yep. a break. Yep. And what we need to do, the second and third generation, is to branch out and to be part of the rest of Britain rather than feeling that there's only a certain part of Britain that we could live in, there's only certain jobs that we could do in terms of our creativity, our ideas that could work really well yeah. in rural Britain. So the only way you're going to stop doing that is to get rid of this idea that rural Britain is, is racist. Because yeah. if you keep actually um, saying that, black people are going to think that this is a foreign land, and the people who are accusing... But Wilford, it's not black people that are saying that the country is That's exactly what I'm... That's exactly my point, is that it's white liberals. That, yeah. that I, I've always felt that, actually, the greatest curse for people of colour are white liberals. Yeah. Because white liberals are there to th treat black people as victims. Yeah. Yeah. And they make a fortune out of this, yeah. you know, they're all saying, well, the problem is this, and, and, and our job is to hold their hands and, 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 yeah. and help them through. And I really have an aversion to okay. do that, and I, I like to remind people of colour, we are courageous people yeah. that came to this country, yeah. Yeah. and therefore we don't need to feel that we're... We're pioneers. Exactly, exactly. And so one of the reasons I called my, the brand The Black Farmer because I wanted to put it out there, because yeah. it begs the question, well, why aren't they black farmers in this country? Because I'm from a farming background. Most of the people yeah. who came from the Caribbean came from farming yes, backgrounds. exactly. And then they went and took jobs in, in the city. There's a lot of black people that I meet that would love to actually go into farming, yeah. but actually it's about how do they get the sort of opportunities? How do they get rid of the stereotype that actually rural Britain is yeah. not a place for them? I think the best way we get rid of those stereotypes is to tell the, the white liberals in, in places like Islington to shut up yeah. and uh, get out into the real world. You know that, that those white liberals hate people like you yeah. and they hate people like me because actually I'm not behaving how a black person is meant to behave. Really nice to meet Absolutely you. Absolutely brilliant, my Very friend. Very nice we to meet We will you. try and come to your shop. You must uh, do. There's you a really brilliant do. discussion there yeah. with Wilford. But coming up next, we've got Right versus Left with Matthew Stadlin and Benedict Spence. It's a corker this week. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. 
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9pm only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome to Right vs Left. Joining me today, I have Matthew Stadlin and Benedict Spence. Look, guys, let's get straight to it. Sir Keir Starmer wasn't ever meant to be a Labour Prime Minister. He was meant to be a stopgap, really, for West Stuyton to take over in, in five well, years' who time. Who said that? We, we know that. We know that's I what think the, uh, it's fair to say he didn't anticipate, certainly, this election. He yeah. was about to become Prime Minister. Yeah. His job was to detox by the Labour He's done such a good job. Has, well, he's done a good job. I think... He's not going to be elected because he did a good job. He did yeah. it partly, but also because Boris Johnson and successive prime ministers decided to set fire to their mandate. You know, he wouldn't have been elected if he hadn't done it. He was good there job. to stabilise the shift, get rid of some of the leftists, you know, get a few more well, seats in Parliament. Then he's overperformed, and then he, he? he would have stepped he's aside after. Let's be honest. I don't he's think not overperformed. I, I don't think there, there is a massive. Is underperformed. But this new poll comes out that says that a very, very large number of people compared to Sunak would would like to chat. To Keir Starmer in this sort of environment, in a part, in really? a pub. Because Some, he, well, well he can talk about football, can't he? Yeah. Well, he can, of course. Forty-eight <laughs> percent say, right, that they would prefer to chat or think that they'd, it'd be a good chat in a pub. 
something like, I think, 27% lead over Rishi Sunak. That's important because one of the appeals, I think, to some people of you, Lee, yeah. is they think, oh, I could have a pint with him, or Nigel Farage, I could no, have a pint with him. but if you said to the same set of people, don't compare him to Rishi or any other politician, would you like to go out with Sir Keir Storm yeah. tonight for a pint? They would say no. I bet yeah, you he's a, a bit, I think yeah. he's a bit more interesting, <laughs> You make a bit more comparison. Charisma charismatic behind yeah, the scenes. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, listen, the key thing about Keir Starmer is he's a sensible, grown-up politician. From what I understand, the Labour Party is not quite as triumphal as a lot of people in the yeah. media are. And, uh, you know, to go back to the Rochdale by-election and to, you know, talk about people like George Galloway, and again, the suggestion that they might win a very large majority gives sucker to some people to the idea that you don't necessarily have to vote Labour. You can perhaps do your protest vote, because it doesn't matter because they're going to yeah, get it. They'll worry about that. Or, yeah. They do worry about that, because they don't think that the support is quite as strong as, say, Correct. Boris Johnson's Correct. was, yep. that it is largely... No, they don't dislike Sir Keir Starmer, yep. but nobody is enthused... But, I know the Rochdale by election might suggest otherwise, but I, I think, this is what I'm led to believe, that Keir Starmer has a pretty iron grip on the candidates mm. ahead of the next elections. So I don't think you'll get many hard leftists MPs coming in as part of the new batch if, if Labour do win big. I suspect that Keir Starmer would far rather when have... When you say a hard grip, Matthew, do you think he's fixing things? I wouldn't go as far as to say he's fixing things, but I think he certainly has influence over, over the sort of candidate that is going to be put forward. I suspect that quite a few Tories will stay away from the polls this time, like they did in 97 yeah. when Blair won that landslide. Some will go to, to reform. Keir Starmer has done enough to reassure some Tory voters that they don't have to turn out this time. And that's, as, that's almost as good as, as, as making a whole load of new people say, yeah, we're desperate to vote Labour. Demoralising your enemy, being better than necessarily converting them, I suppose. But uh, Matthew says that um, Sir Keir's overperformed. Mm. I disagree. I don't think he's performed very well at all. He's had a poor opposition. Well, a poor government to, to compete against. You were the deputy chair of the party yes, until a couple of months ago. Well, all I can sit here um, and say these things, um, Matthew. Why, were you, why did you accept the job then? If you deputy chairman. If you thought they were so we poor. weren't. To be honest, when I accepted the job as deputy chairman, that was in, I think it was in February last year. Um, we were in a much better place as a party at, at that stage, and you know, over the past year or so, I always say um, to my colleagues, I'm pretty sure there's somebody in number ten lies awake at night thinking of ridiculous things to say the following day to cost us even more votes. Some people um, might say that of you, though, Lee. Well, no, no, because my, my job was membership. My job was to go around and rally the troops, get people to sign up, to, motiva uh, to motivate the troops and to speak at after dinner, which I did very successfully. I probably spoke at over 100 associations up and down the country, raised lots of money for the campaign, and I'm very proud of what I did, because there's still a lot of people, good people within the Conservative Party who are class as my friends, but, you know, it's number 10. Um, and, but how know, can you say Starmer hasn't done a good job? Think, well, well, done then, think of where the Labour Party was under Jeremy Corbyn. People like me, yeah. who'd voted Labour all my life, yeah. could not vote Labour when Jeremy Corbyn so was what, leader. What's, it was a disastrous again, result in 2019. Again, and we're now talking about is, the possibility it's, it's, of a landslide. Again, it's questionable how many people are going to sort of come out for Ke Sir Keir Starmer, yeah. because what we're talking about is simply people not turning out for Rishi yeah. Sunak. And, I mean, it's, it's a very frustrating position, I think, for a lot of people on the right. Look, because guys, even though it's not likely that let's get this in the board. Sure. Matthew's getting excited. <laughs> um, again, we're going to do the yes or no quiz. I've got five questions. You know the rules. Um, that we, we have got a character that comes in called Stephen Pound. He's been on about ten times and he's never won it yet. And he's I've just... won it every time I've got <laughs> yeah. I'm worried about this chat, though. Uh, Benedict has done this before. So, first question, Benedict. Should we have a referendum on leaving the ECHR? No. <laughs> no. Matthew, should boats in the channel be turned back the same day? No. Yes. Benedict, will Donald Trump win the US election? <laughs> yeah, he will. Ah, oh, sorry, mate. It was a yes, uh, he will. <laughs> Can't give you that one. Mark, he's laughing yeah. his, he's Mark, laughing I've his missed an open goal. I can't believe Number it. four, I'm sorry, I wanted you to win this. Uh, but <sighs> will Rishi last until the general election? Yes. No. And final question is, will Labour have a landslide victory at the general election? Yes. Yes. The left in the corners won. This is a disgrace, Benedict. You had five... On a technicality. <laughs> it's not a te a te it is a technicality. <laughs> it's a yes. That's the point of the game. That's the only way you can <laughs> lose the game. Oh. Yes. You've just got to put your fingers in your ears and go, um, yes or no. Unbelievable. So, yeah. do you want to come back on one, uh, Benedict? 
On the subject of the referendum of, on the ECHR, yeah. I'm not necessarily opposed to the idea of leaving the ECHR yeah. in principle. Yeah. My issue is I don't think that you can currently, I don't think the Conservatives can win a referendum. And even if they were, yeah. why on earth would you do that just as the Labour Party are about to come into government? Why on earth would you give your opponents an open goal as to what would replace it? I think it's something you could have done five years ago. It would be a really stupid idea to do that. Can you imagine the stress of going through another toxic, divisive referendum? It would be like Brexit all over again. And actually, I disagree with you on who might win. I suspect we might vote to leave the ECHR. I think that's a bad thing. You could say I'm being anti-democratic, therefore, in not calling for a referendum. I don't want to live in a society where every important issue is decided by a referendum. Yep. We have people like you, whether we agree with you or not, around the country. We have a localised system of democracy. We have people like you, our elected representative, and we have to trust you to get it right. That's why we vote for you, or don't. So you like local representation? I think it's important. I, I was interviewed. But you also like the ECHR as well. I, uh, look, I'm, <laughs> no, because I think there's a point. Did you win on this I, one? I, I absolutely can, and it's on the face of it a clever point. But I think having international checks and balances, being part of an international legal system where we actually sign up to some important core principles, such as, like you'd agree with, freedom of expression, freedom of thought, liberty, life, all those sorts of things, and fair elections. Just a, just a quick one. I was interviewed it's always a quick one, isn't it? I was it's always a quick one. I've been there for ten minutes Interviewed now. Theresa May, <laughs> yeah. and I would be critical of her, Name's of course, when she was Prime Minister, yeah. but we were on stage together. And she, there's something that is very impressive about her, and that is that even when she was Prime Minister, she worked hard, it seems, for her constituents. She still went round knocking on doors. She understood that the only reason she was able to be in a position to be a number 10 was because her, her local constituents voted her in. I think that's precious. Yeah, that's Don't you? Precious. Not really. I think... Uh, <laughs> uh, well, tell that to your constituents, Lee, and they might boot you out. Well, look, we'll see. We'll see. Um, hopefully you'll come up and help me on the campaign trail. <laughs> Can you imagine? You in Asheville. <laughs> Benedict, I'd love to have you up there knocking a few doors. Look, that's been a, another lively discussion, but coming up next, we've got Last Orders with former glamour model Danielle Mason. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who 
will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. It's time for Last Orders with 